good. He even gave an amen. That's good. I like that. We should take the word of God, please, and turn with me, if you would, to the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Um, we're going to be attempting to close out Ephesians 5, uh, though we won't do that today. We will do it in the next coming weeks. And the reason being is we're going to backtrack a little bit from where we closed off last week and, and uh, use it as a launching pad for this week and do our very best to get into it. Just because with the attack and what is going on in our homes, I think we really need to take the time to see what God has ordained for our homes in the sense of uh, not only all our, our, our roles, uh, but also um, what, what it should look like. Uh, this is coming from somebody that didn't know what a Christian home looked like until after I got saved, and uh, which has been uh, good in a way because it has forced me to study more on what the scripture says and to pay attention to not only to what's happening, uh, in the scripture, but also uh, what's happening in that home, whether it may come right out and say it, uh, there are certain things you can learn from the home. We'll talk about a little bit about Jacob and his mother, and uh, it may not be speaking directly about their home, but there were some things going on in that home uh, that weren't good, uh, and the position that we've been given as parents, uh, which we won't get to probably today, uh, but the position we've been given as parents is a great responsibility because our, our, our children are following, or they want to follow, or they want to be led uh, by their parents. And so we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, starting in verse number 18. So we're going to back up just a little bit. And it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband." There is teeming with the setting of Scripture, example after example of he's seeing as we're doing these things, we're doing it either unto the Lord or as the Lord. This great example that's been given to us, but he begins it at the very part by saying, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. When home is ruled according to God's world, word, Charles Spurgeon says, uh, Angels might be asked to, uh, to stay with us, and they would not find themselves out of their element. And what I'm saying is that the, the design and the picture of the home is really having heaven in your home. It's not only something that is good, but I believe from Scripture is commanded of us that it's not just something that we can do, but we should do. What makes a Christian home? I won't get ahead of myself too far, but so many people say they have a Christian home because the dad is a Christian or the mom is a Christian or the mom and the dad are Christian. That does not make a Christian home. No more than me having a car in my garage makes me a mechanic or going for surgery in a hospital makes me a doctor. No, there are things that must happen and it beginning by the individual being filled with the Spirit of God. He says, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with wine. The Spirit. The trouble is that many homes are not governed by God's Word. Would we agree with that? Would you agree that today homes are not governed by God's Word? How do we know that? Because the majority of people's Bibles only move on Sundays and Wednesdays. All right? 
Now, that's not to say if you use a Bible app or things like that. I use my Bible app every day. Uh, it keeps me accountable. I have my little devotions I do on there, and then it bings at me and bings at me. So even when I'm in my flesh, it reminds me, quit being a heathen, do your Bible study, right? And uh, so I'm not saying that, but there is something to be said about pages you can turn and things you can highlight and things you can mark on and things like that. Now, don't get me wrong. They're getting all kinds of fancy nowadays. You can write on electronics with pens and things like that and highlight it and all kinds of stuff. I'm just not there yet. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad or wrong. I think it's good. I just, I'm not that, I'm not that cool yet, okay? I'm not, I just haven't made it there yet, all right? But uh, uh, our real homes must be governed by uh, the Word of God. And it's sad that they aren't, even by professing, professing Christians. And the consequences of such homes are tragic. They're tragic. It's not just not good. It's not just you're not as good as this. It's tragic. We're losing generations of young people. Marriages, Christian marriages are falling apart because husbands claim to be Christian but don't treat their wives as Christ said to treat their wives. Husbands say, wives say they're Christian but they're not submissive to their husband as God tells them to be submissive. Children claim to make a profession of Christ but they are not obedient as God has told them to be obedient. So therefore, we are not a Christian home even though we may say we're Christian. Instead of angels being guests in our homes, we are inviting devils into our home. We're inviting demonic influence and oppression into our homes. And I know that people like to tell you that that stuff isn't real, but it is real. It is. It's very real. Too many marriages end in divorce. And I'm not just talking about non-Christians. They end up in the courtroom and young children watch as mom and dad tear one another apart so selfishly as those kids suffer and wonder what did I do wrong? And I know you can say, honey, it's not you. Honey, it's not you. It doesn't matter. They still think it. They still think it. The poet William Copper called the home the only bliss of paradise that, hasn't sur that, that has survived the fall. God instituted marriage, and something is, that God is still blessing today is marriage. And he's given us a design for that. But too many times, homes are the outpost of hell instead of a parcel of paradise. For this paradise to exist, Paul states that we must be filled with the Spirit of God. And this is not a suggestion, but it is a command. The word, the phrase filled with the Spirit is in the present tense. So that means to be, keep, uh, keep being filled. In other words, you have the Spirit of God, but the filling of the Spirit of God and is, remember, when we get saved, we receive the Spirit of God inside of us, right? And we are identified with the body of Christ, and I belong to Christ's body. But being filled with the Spirit means that my body belongs to Christ. We think of being filled with the Spirit like I have to do something to fill it in. But really, it's really kind of the opposite. It's you surrendering everything you are to God that He might fill it, and He might do what He has to do. It's kind of contrary to what we often think. Well, if I read my Bible, then I'll be filled more with the Spirit. If I pray more, I'll be filled more. Well, it's really more of dying to self and doing all those things. Yes, yes, I'm reading my Bible. Yes, I'm praying, but I'm doing it saying, God, I am all yours. I, I belong to you. You must do in me what I cannot do. The Spirit of God is the one that reveals truth to you, right? You can read things, you can understand it, but God has to reveal things to you you can't understand. You know, when I, when I first read this phrase years ago and said, it said that uh, this is a great mystery, I was a young man who just got married. And I'm like, you better believe it. Understanding women, that's a mystery. That's not why I don't think what he's talking about. But here is this great, really plain truth in front of us. The reason I think oftentimes it's a mystery, it's a mystery why we don't live the way that God has told us to live. But he says, being filled with the Spirit, and that word filled isn't like you would pour in but it's being controlled. And we know that also, too, by the way it's being used here. Being filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, where it's an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I know that I, I don't drink at all. And I know for me, if I started drinking next to a relative of mine who drinks every weekend, unashamedly, he would be able to drink way more than me before I, you know, I'd be toasted and he would just be getting buzzed, right? Why? Because I have no tolerance for it, okay? So it's not about the amount there. 
It's about having full control of you. Whatever that point is, it has full control of you. When somebody gets 100% blitz wasted, they don't remember what they're doing. They lose control of everything. And when I mean everything, I mean everything. And so he's saying, be filled or be controlled by the Spirit of God. We see this in other settings of Scripture. We see it in Luke 4, 28, when speaking about wrath. He says, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Now, it wasn't like they had a little funnel and they filled themselves up with wrath. No, they were, their actions were being controlled by their wrath. Same with envy in Acts 13, 45. It says, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoke of Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So they were controlled by their envy, which caused them to take action against what they saw. We see it with subtlety in Acts 13, 10. Uh, speaking of illness, he said, And said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And so he was controlled by his sneakiness, his subtlety. It was directing the ways in which he was going, and it made him do different actions. So here's Paul writing, very rightly so, telling them, as you would think, everything associated with alcohol, being drunk, being controlled, being consumed, be that in the Spirit of God. Allow the Spirit of God to have so much control of you, you don't even know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not talking like blindly, but I don't know how many times we talk to somebody and, and when the Spirit takes control, you're like, wow, where did that come from? That is the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God has full control of you and your heart, then he will have your home. Then he will have your home. Oh, that we would have spirit-filled people. Now, it reminds me of a story of a little boy and his family, and they had a little child, and they brought the baby up to be dedicated, and, and they did through the whole service, and the pastor did the whole thing about presenting the baby to the Lord and, and talking about having a Christian home and things like that. And on the way home, the older little brother was crying uncontrollably, and the father asked, what is wrong with you? What are you crying for? And he wouldn't answer him. And he asked him again, said, why are you crying? It was such a great service. What are you crying for? And finally, after the third time asking, what are you crying for? He says, the pastor said that we need to have a Christian home. And he goes, I don't want that. I want our home. Okay, so the description of his home wasn't exactly what he thought it was. Yeah. Could you imagine a parent hearing that from your kid? I don't want to have a Christian home. I want our home. Hold on a second. Don't we have a Christian home? Sometimes children are unfortunately honest, aren't they? <laughs> he goes, I don't want a Christian home. I want to stay with you guys. <laughs> being filled with the Spirit is often and rightly connected to preaching and witnessing, isn't it? We think of being filled with the Spirit. We're thinking of doing some, uh, I, I hate to say it this way, but some religious work, right? I need to be filled with the Spirit so I preach. That's true. Uh, I need to be filled with, filled with the Spirit so I can witness. That's true. Uh, it says the Spirit of God came on them, and then they are witnesses, right? In Acts 1.8. Uh, so we often connect it with, with these super hard or above beyond kind of way of living. But Paul says it needs to be in our home. As much as you would pray and labor over a message and make sure God is in it so that way you're not either conveying something untruthful or that you're just having a flesh show. When you wake up and you pray for your family, you're begging God, Holy Spirit, have control of me because I'm going to go out and I'm going to lead these children in my home. I'm going to lead my wife. I'm going to submit to my husband. I'm going to instruct my children. Holy Spirit, have full control. And you hear this kid scream in the background and say, Holy Spirit, I need a double portion. Right? <laughs> but no, why is it that we don't pray like that for our kids? Now, now, don't get me wrong. None of you ever, none of you in here, I would hope not, would say, well, you know, there's preaching and then there's my kids. I would hope you would never say like that. Because I believe if we're to be filled with the Spirit involving the way we handle our homes and filled with the Spirit when we're preaching, it's all instruction in the Word of God. And I'm not just talking about teaching because what are the greatest lessons? The greatest lessons are more caught than taught, aren't they? They see dad and they see mom and the way they live and the way they respond. But it's necessary to having heaven in our home we find out that this is essential. Some of those 
events we are talking about being filled with the Spirit are being described of these great men of God. It says in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of people and elders of Israel. Uh, Acts 4.31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Uh, Acts 6, 3 and 5 says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over the business. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and a Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmius, and uh, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Uh, so we see, yes, that this is very important that we are filled with the Spirit when we're doing things for God. But when we are running our home, when we are keeping order in our home, we're working with our children, is that not just as essential? Because do they not have eternal souls? Does your wife not have an eternal soul? Does your husband not have an eternal soul? Are we not all going to stand before God one day and give an account for that? So what, ought we not to be in our homes spirit-filled? The answer is yes, absolutely. But what happens is we get caught up in life and we diminish the value of what our own home is. And I wouldn't say purposefully. Just like a marriage that is so fresh, you get married and we've had so many, we've had two couples in the last two weeks get married, right? And Julia and Aaron are on the way back from their honeymoon and, and uh, uh, Devin and Tyler are going off some other time for their honeymoon. And right now, everything that they're doing is so cute and so precious. That gets, goes away eventually, doesn't it? <laughs> the jokes you laughed at and you were so smitten at, and now what does your wife do, right? Mm -hmm. Rolls her eyes, right? Right? I'm sure. You never do that, Miss Kelly. You, he's always hilarious. He's done something. No, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Wendy never does that either, right? You guys, oh, I, can, I see all the time when they wear husbands walk in, you're like, oh, they're so precious. No, you're like, let's go. The kids got it. Let's go. Get this. Your kid's running around, right? Yeah, no. That's how it is, right? You, you get the, it's all fresh and new, and then somewhere along the line, you get used to it. Then you start talking in ways you shouldn't talk, or maybe you're not appreciative like we should be. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe everybody else here is like values everything in their relationship like they always should. That's not true. We, we're fleshly people, right? But why? It's because it's not guarded as such. When I go out on visitation, when I go door knocking, when I'm passing out tracts, I always pray that God uses it. Why? Because I think to myself, man, this is a soul that needs to be reached for Christ, and I, Lord, use this in a mighty way. So what am I telling my children and my wife when I'm not doing the same exact thing? I'm just being honest with myself, right? So we must be following ourselves, finding the power of the Spirit of God by submitting to Him. Paul states that there are three evidences of the Spirit-filled home that we find in verses 18 through 33 of Ephesians chapter 5. We find that a spiritual home is joyful, it is thankful, and it's submissive. We are going to do our very best to talk about being joyful tonight. Whether we'll get through it all tonight or not, that we'll see, we'll see what happens, okay? We'll do our best and forget the rest, amen? So Paul said nothing about miracles of tongues or special manifestations. He stated that the home can be a heaven on earth and each family member is controlled by the Spirit and is joyful, thankful, and submissive. So look at verse number 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Again, notice that on phrase to the Lord. Joy is not something that rises and falls like a thermostat in your house due to the issues of pleasure or displeasure throughout your home. Joy is based upon the promises of our Savior, which do not change. Okay? So if you're looking for joy, it's found in Jesus. All right? You're looking for happiness, you find that in your spouse and in circumstances and things like that, but joy is found in Jesus, and Jesus does not change. So when we say, oh, my, my joy isn't like it should be, the, no, that's on you then, because Jesus hasn't changed. Now, your happiness might not be the same. And maybe your husband doesn't treat you the best, your, your wife doesn't treat you the best, or your kids are getting on your nerves. That might control your happiness, or if you're being irritated, but we are commanded to be joyful. And you can maintain the level of joy no matter your circumstance because and by being filled with the Holy Spirit. We, now we know this because Paul wrote about rejoicing while in prison. 
He said, whatever stage I am in, there I am content. So we find that no matter the situation or the station in our life, we can be joyful. And having heaven in our home comes first by having a home that is joyful, is joyful. Our joy comes from the truth of what Jesus is. Now, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of problems, we can find great joy. Now, the world can't understand how we can have joy even in trial. Matter of fact, when we have joy, excessive joy, and they can't explain it, what did they do in the Bible? They accused them of being what? Drunk, right? Acts chapter 2, verse 13 through 15 says, Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as he supposed, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. In other words, isn't it interesting how Paul used that illustration of be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So a Spirit-filled person in joy looks crazy to the world that's lost. And they can't explain it. That guy's a weirdo. You know? You know how many times I got called gay because I was happy all the time? Oh, all the time. When I worked at Cedar Point, I got accused of it all the time. And I'm like, have you met my girlfriend? Have you met my wife? Or whatever the case may be. I know I'm weird. I know I'm eccentric. But the world doesn't know how to explain it. So you think there's got to be something wrong with you. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some things wrong. I get it. I'm, I'll be the first to admit that but I'm not sinful. And so the world can't explain it either. Whoa, look at these guys dancing around, singing. Hey, think about it. Okay, so Acts chapter two, just shortly after this, what's gonna happen? They're gonna get beat. They're gonna get sat on the prison. And after they're beat, they're gonna be doing what? After they got beat, rejoicing and singing. I don't know about you, <laughs> but anytime I got beat growing up, I wasn't like, that was great. Man, you guys need to get in on this action. Let's get some more of that. Uh. Uh, no, that's not how it was. Not at all. The major difference is that the drunk makes a fool of himself, but the spirit-filled Christian brings honor and glory to God. So what is, how does he say to do it? Well, he says, look at the very beginning, in the way that we are speaking. In the way that we're speaking. Now, look at the direction of your speech. Now, you can look at this in two, I, I can look at this in two different ways and I can get something from it in two different ways. One, I can see to yourselves singular and I can see to yourselves plural, okay? So if I'm just speaking to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, there is a responsibility that I have individually to have an individual relationship with the Lord. I have an individual responsibility to put my body into subjection, to, to commit my mind to God, to have a heart for the Lord, to desire him, to pray, to die to self every single day. But then plural together in my home, we have a responsibility to honor and glorify God with our home as husband and wife. A joy-filled home flows from individuals whose heart is surrendered to God. I would say as an individual, learn to talk biblically in your home. What do I mean by that? Use biblical phrases. We live in a day and age today that's trying to find new ideals to make churches grow and blah, blah, blah. And we say all these things. There's a new phrase out there. Uh, what, what was it, Rob? Deconstruction? Yeah, deconstruction. We're deconstructing our faith. What they're saying there is break your faith down to what you've always been taught, examine it, scrutinize it, and then, build, and then you're supposed to build your faith of purity on that. But what does that lead to? That's not looking at it with eyes of truth. That's looking at it through eyes of scrutiny. There's great danger behind that. Yeah. See, we're not talking, that's not biblical speech, deconstructing your faith. That's not biblical speech. Having discernment about your faith, that's biblical speech. And your kids aren't going to talk biblical if you don't talk biblical. Don't try to rewrite the Bible. Just read it for what it's written. You don't understand a word, look it up. Yeah. Teach it to your children that way. Uh, even when you look, it says, be filled with the Spirit. Explain that to your kids. It's not filling a glass. It's being totally controlled by it, all right? Use your little child and grab them by the shoulders and push them all over the house and say, look, Dad is controlling everywhere you go. Make fun of it, you know, like, oh, he's going here. He's going here. Then all your kids are going to start laughing. And what are you going to say? Look, Dad was fully in control. There's nothing he could do about it because I overpower him. So the Holy Spirit should overpower us 
and help us where we move and where we ought to go. Not that we are puppets, but we are willingly submitting ourselves to God. So in our speech and things that we're speaking of. So go with me to Colossians 3, all right? And put, hold your place there in Ephesians 5. These are the two places we'll be going back and forth synonymously for the next couple of weeks. So Colossians 3 really kind of rehashes or, or gives a similar sentiment that we see here in Ephesians chapter 5. And in Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13, we'll get a little further into it, gives us seven, I guess you could call them ingredients, if you will, uh, that could be particular in the Christian home for great success, uh, and they go well together to make a beautiful meal in the home. Amen. And so Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 says this, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So we see, first of all, that one of those ingredients is being merciful. Being merciful to somebody. Maybe they have done you wrong. Show them mercy. Christ has shown us mercy. God has shown us mercy time and time again. You can see where God showed mercy. Jesus showed mercy to people in his own ministry. Show kindness. Show, we live in such a rude world. You know what? Kindness is now beginning to set believers apart from unbelievers. Isn't that sad? Just being kind? It used to be even lost people were kind. But now everybody wants to be rude. Be kind. Be kind to people. Even if they're rude to you, if they're rude to you, be even more kind to them. Why? Because Christ was kind to you, even when you were rude to him. So be kind. Humbleness of mind. Humbleness of mind. Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. So then what is this going to do? This is going to eliminate murmuring and complaining in your home. Please don't produce that. All right? All uh, right. We've said many, many times here, and this is not my quote, this is a quote from somebody else, uh, but you always produce what you promote. So if your children see you complaining about everything in every situation, don't yell at them for complaining. You have trained them well. I have to worry about this sometimes. I'm like, man, oh, I don't want to complain about this stuff. And why am I complaining about it? What's it going to do any good? Not going to change anything, right? So be humble, humble yourself, humbleness of mind. Be meekness, that's strength and control. Long-suffering and forbearing. So what is it? A lot of people say, what's the difference between long-suffering and forbearing? Long-suffering would be described as patiently enduring mistreatment. So maybe somebody isn't treating you the best way. Uh, and this is not certainly meaning to be a, a stepping stone or, or endure abuse. But sometimes we have to be long-suffering towards people that aren't quite getting it just yet. Jesus did this even with his own disciples. And he would ask them to do something and they weren't able to do it. And he basically said, fine, I'll do it myself. And he was, it says during that same scripture that they were, he was long-suffering with them, dealing with what they should have already known. And forbearing would be basically uh, patiently putting up with indebtedness, or if you will, putting up with somebody, if you will, forbearing them, and then forgiving them. These are ingredients that help to have a healthy home. And what does it promote in the home? Well, it promotes peace in the home. It promotes peace. So back there in Colossians chapter 3, it says in verse number 14, and above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be thankful. So there should be peace in a Christian home. Our homes should not be war rooms. They should be havens of rest. They should be a little slice of heaven one for another. If the peace of God reigns in our hearts, should it be logical that that peace should reign in our homes? Right? The Bible says that the peace of God reigns in our hearts with a peace that passes understanding. Should that not overflow into the homes in which we live? That peace should be there. If a husband is saved, it doesn't necessarily, as we said before, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a Christian home. Is the peace of God ruling and reigning in that home? A Christian home is marked by the peace of God ruling and reigning in that home. So if we have the peace and we have the way in which we speak one to another, but look what it, says, it goes on to say, speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So singing, joy is brought about singing. Now listen, this is where people always like to say, well, you've never heard me sing before. It's not very joyful. Yes, it is. 
If you're singing as unto the Lord, it is a joy, okay? Maybe you're not getting your recording contract. Maybe you're not going to get it behind the pulpit, but that's fine if you did want to. If God gave you a song and it's not like Jesus take the wheel or some kind of crazy song, sure, come on up and sing it. Amen? Uh, as long as it's approved by the people that do the music here, you're good to go, okay? Learn that lesson a long time ago. Ask questions. Amen? But uh, if it's a psalm or a hymn or a spiritual song, which we'll talk about in a minute, then absolutely. But your home should be marked by a melody in your heart, a great melody. Go with me to Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Look at verses 1 through 6 in Psalm 40. And if you guys have ever been to camp or a camp, they sing that song all the time. Making melodies in my heart. Making melodies in my heart. And if you know by the end of that song, you look really silly and ridiculous because it's like thumbs back, elbows back feet apart, knees bent, head to the side, tongue out, spinning around, and then by the time you're, it's just quite fun, but really, it is great making melodies in your heart, amen? So, Psalm 40, verse 1 through 6, talks about putting a new song in your heart. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respect, uh, respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. So he gives us here this new song. And he says, because of the song in which we're singing and the way we're living, he says that people are being reached. It says, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Now, this isn't, doesn't mean you have to be physically singing. But it does mean there's a melody in your heart, which in your heart, you sound like Luther Vandross. You sound like you just insert your favorite singer. That's who you sound like in your heart, amen? You got perfect vibrato. You got perfect pitch. Why? Because it's as unto the Lord. And when you are singing that melody and you have your favorite song playing in your heart, is th this is exactly what you look like when that happens, right? When you have your favorite song playing, I can see you in your car. It's your favorite song, blaring. Oh, I love this song when it comes on. No. No, you're in there. You're, you know, most of you are like singing until you see someone pull next to you and you're like, and as soon as they drive away, you're like singing your song. Yeah, that's the melody in your heart. It's like you're happy and people see that. And he says, because they see, man, there's something different about this guy. He's a weird, what is, why are you so weird? Why are you always smiling all the time? Look like a crazy Rottweiler, you know? And then it gives you an opportunity to tell them, you know, I just been, the Lord put the song on my heart and I've just been singing and singing. It's been so great. And I'm telling you, I have been able to give the gospel to more people just by having a song in my heart than anything else. And it usually starts with, man, you ain't right. But what's not right about me? I'm not right according to the world. But like when everybody's yelling, screaming, and crying at Cracker Barrel, here I am singing songs, getting drinks with people. This one person heard this guest yell at me and yell at me about something that was out of my control. And she's like, I cannot believe you didn't rip their face off. I'm like, why? He goes, and I watch you later on. You're getting even nicer to them. Why? I said, because that's my challenge, heaping coals upon their head. I'm going to love them to death. Hopefully not for real, but to death. Why? That's our duty as a believer because you're not going to change and rob my joy because you hate life. Amen. I have a Savior that saved me and that song clouds it. Just like guys that aren't a mechanic here, when your car makes noises, what do you do? Turn the radio up. That's what a good man does. Turn the radio up. You can't hear it, right? So when the world gets nasty on the outside, turn that Holy Spirit up. Amen? Like, turn up the song in your heart. Be reminded of what, what God has done for you and let it be seen to the world. Who cares what people think? Brother Arp and I are two peas in a pod, you know? I got my motorcycle when I can get the thing started. And uh, I got my songs playing in the background. We got the inspirations. We got Christian songs. You know how many times I pulled up to a light and like Oliver B. Green's preaching. He's like, welcome, beloved. And I tell you, the Bible says, and people are like this in their car going. 
looking at me like I'm crazy. And that's fine. That's fine. Because you know what? If I would pull up there, you know, they wouldn't even look twice at me. Maybe they'd been like, oh, oh, you know. But I want them to think, what in the world is that guy listening? Because what are they going to do? They're going to go, what's he listening to? You never know. I've heard of God reaching people. I've listened on Shackle where this guy was turning through his, this is back when you had to turn every station. You couldn't just hit seek, okay? And he's turning his dial and he turned his dial and he got an exit ramp. And so on the whole, it was a huge exit ramp, almost like the one, uh, it was bigger than the one over here in Norwalk. And by the time he was on that exit ramp, the guy was given an invitation and God already been working this guy's heart already. And this guy gives an invitation. By the time he got to the top of the exit ramp, the guy goes, I had to pull over because I knew God was speaking to me. So God can use something like that, even in a stoplight or when you're driving by. Uh, you find people that have Bluetooth in their car and you, you hurry up and pirate their Bluetooth where you're driving by and they start listening to your music. It's really fun. But anyway, uh, I'm not encouraging that, but I am. So he says, hey, this new song. So Psalm 42 verse 8 says, uh, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto God, the God of my life. What happened in Acts 16, 25 when Paul and Silas what were they doing in the jail? Moping, complaining, whining? No. It says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. What happened toward the end of that? Wasn't there a, a said jailer who got saved? And what's say after that? And his house. See, your song matters to people. I get it. You wake up, you can say, I'm not a morning person. But you know who is? Jesus. He is. You say, I'm not a night person. I work third shift. That's okay. You know who can keep you alert? Jesus. I don't like people. You know who loves people? Jesus. See, this is what I'm saying. This is being controlled by the Spirit. I don't care what you like. I don't care what you're good at. I don't care what, it doesn't matter. We're supposed to be controlled by the Spirit of God. So if you don't like people, then die to self. And let the one who loves people, gave himself for those people, take control of you, get your garbage attitude out of the way, and start serving the Lord. Because guess what? You don't like people. You may get verbalized to people. Guess who else sees it? Your children. And now you've taught them that it's okay to despise the people that Jesus died for. Amen. goes right there. Don't do that. Amen. Never underestimate the power of a song. You know, there should be a kinship amongst believers, shouldn't there? There should be a kindredship, a connection. There was an article that was written in a newspaper not too long ago, and it says, the bar, the friendliest place in town. And the pastor saw that, and he said, well, I'm, I'm going to make it a purpose that I'm going to clip every article from my newspaper for the next month that has connection to this bar. Well, everything that was connected with that bar was brawls and murder and crime for the next month. But it's the friendliest place on earth. But let me explain this to you. Do you know what happens every single week in and out for the most part? Those people that were in the brawl, that had the problems, that experienced bad things, they go back. Because what connects them is the drinking and the drunkenness. And there is a weird camaraderie there where they could fight each other and literally come back and be like, hey, how was your week? Now, why is it when we come to the church and we're spirit-filled, Somebody takes your pew, and you can't even be in the same church as them anymore. Because the Spirit is what's supposed to connect us together. The Spirit should be the one that is a connecting kindredship, and we lose out on joy because we are finding ourselves not controlled or filled with the Spirit. It shouldn't be said that drunkards can have a bad experience and they go back to the bar, and Christians can have a bad experience in a church and not go back to the church. And that oftentimes we run to misunderstandings. So what can we do? I'll finish up with this point here. You can fill your homes with music that honors Christ. Fill your homes with music that honors Christ. So he talks about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, okay? So psalms would be divinely inspired lyrics because we have the book of psalms. And if we believe the word of God is divinely inspired, so they would be writing those. Hymns would not be divinely inspired lyrics, but they often incorporate scripture or scriptural themes in them. Your spiritual songs would be a little more, they'd be more general, uh, but it would be something like, 
uh, talking about the holiness of God or maybe singing about a doctrine of God or maybe even singing about the transformation that God has upon people or even a personal testimony. This is my story. This is my song. That'd be kind of a spiritual song, if you will. All right. Uh, so they are under that genre. Now, your style may be different. All right. Um, and, and this is not the purpose of the, the message. But be careful on what you condemn if God doesn't condemn it, all right? There are certain styles that I don't like. It's not my cup of tea, but it's not wicked, all right? There are some styles that are not my cup of tea, and I believe they are wicked. They promote, uh, I'm, to have Christian death metal, I don't understand that. How can you have death metal representing Christ? But that's, that's neither here nor there, all right? Uh, and all those types of things. But if you are promoting godliness, if you are truly wanting to live for God, and do that, at the end of the day, you're going to stand before God, not me. Uh, most of that music will never make its way into our pulpit and things like that. But I wouldn't say all those songs are terrible. Um, and if you've had any conversations with me, you know my personal conviction on that. So don't worry, we're not slip and sliding anywhere, okay? Uh, but anyway, so these are all things that can bring heaven into our home. I'll never forget Pastor Lewis. I'll finish with this. Pastor Lewis uh, had hired a guy to do some work in his house. And... The guy was there all week working, and at the end of the day, at the end of the week, he got done with the job, and Pastor Lewis paid him, and he said, Pastor, I want to tell you that this has been the most delightful week of my career of owning my business. He goes, oh, why is that? He goes, job that easy? He goes, no, no, it wasn't. He goes, matter of fact, I ran into quite a few problems. He goes, but there's something about your home that no matter what's happening outside, as soon as I walk in here, there is a peace. And there is just something in this home I cannot explain. What is it? And he goes, you got a couple minutes, I'd love to tell you. Now this is just by playing good godly music, keeping the spirit of God in your home up. But half the time we have things playing in the background that should have no business being in a Christian home. Or you've got children and adults with headsets on in their own little world talking to some guy over in China or, or Uzbekistan or England or even across the country playing video games. And I'm not condemning video games. I, I play video games when I have time, which is never. But anyway, uh, I know that was good. That's good. When you make a baby that can't even understand you laugh, that's a good joke. Amen? No. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, we're so closed off. But when we do have things on, it's like the TV is the central console. You know? Every once in a while, my, my kids will go, hey, why is the TV and Xbox unplugged? I said, well, apparently, mom wants you to spend time doing something else besides watching the TV or do something else, you know? Because if we're not careful, we can let our kids be raised by the TV or by an iPad or by a phone very easily. My kids ask me, well, not all of them, just one now, ask, hey, can I have your phone? I want to do this. No, you can't. Go outside. We have five acres. Go play. Go get dirty. Go break a leg. No, I'm just going to break a leg. You know, go have fun. Get dirt on yourself, you know? Do something fun. We have goats. We have cats, you know? We've got mosquitoes. Go play with something outside, right? But uh, having heaven in your home, bringing music in your And we'll come back and we'll finish some of this up uh, next week and we'll try to keep pressing on uh, with making melody and all that stuff. But I got a couple more things on that and uh, we'll finish up, okay? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to...